Hello and welcome to this in-depth look into T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Eliot began writing this poem in late 1921. Originally it was titled, He Do the Police in Different Voices. This is a line from Charles Dickens' Our Mutual Friend, and it gives us an indication of why Eliot wrote the poem in the format that he did. In the Dickens work, one of the characters reads a newspaper aloud in different voices. It is believed that this is what inspired Eliot as he wanted to convey the same sense of chaos and disorder in the post-war modern world. The, po the poem contains allusions from beginning to end and is at times completely undecipherable. To get the best understanding of the poem, it is suggested that the reader accept the fact that there are some parts of it that are impossible to decipher. Eliot intended it to be this way. The point that Eliot was stressing was that life isn't always cut and dry, and we have to do the best we can with what we have. After writing the majority of it, and amongst some personal struggles, Eliot gave the poem to Ezra Pound to help finish it. Pound eventually cut the length of it in half and changed the title to The Wasteland. At the beginning of the poem, Eliot pays tribute to Pound by inserting in the Italian words Il Miglior Fabro, which is translated to say, The Better Craftsman. You will notice this poem is broken into five distinct sections, all taking place in different settings with many different speakers and narrators. Below the title, er Eliot inserts an epigraph written in Greek. The epigraph speaks of a Greek sibyl, which is a female prophetess of Greek and Roman mythology. The sibyl is asked, What do you want? To which she replies, I want to die. Apollo had granted the sibyl immortality, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth. Consequently, the sibyl withers away into old age, eternally. Eliot sets the scene right from the start of a dead, desolate, hopeless, and empty place. The first section we see is entitled The Burial of the Dead, which describes an Anglican burial service. In this section, Eliot sets the stage for us visually. He describes the wasteland as a stony rubbish, a heap of broken images where the sun never beats. He, is, he describes the dead tree that gives no shelter, the cricket that gives no relief, and the dry stone that gives no sound of water. This is truly a desolate place, both physically and emotionally. Let's take a deeper look at what may be happening here. Interestingly, Eliot begins this section by describing April as the cruelest month of the year, a month that is usually known for a time of renewal. He describes a scene of lilacs growing out of a dead land, with memories and desires flowing through the speaker's mind. The speaker in lines 5 through 7 actually appears to be someone underground, a corpse perhaps. This may be the first reference we see Eliot make to those who died as a result of the war. Immediately following this speaker we encounter another one, someone named Marie. She speaks of recollections of young childhood memories growing up in Germany. She tells of a winter and a summer season and sledding with a cousin. Eliot had actually met a countess and second cousin to King Ludwig II of Bavaria, whose name was actually Marie. We believe the speaker here is this same Marie. In this section, she is symbolically sledding down into the wasteland. Many believe that because Eliot was so opposed to the state of post-war Europe and its political nationalism, he manifested his observations and feelings in the wasteland concerning church, community, and nation, as he saw them in this time in history. Eliot was said to be the great traditionalist and felt that Europe was headed toward political and religious desolation because of its new national identity. Eliot also had a personal connection with the Great War through a good friend, Jean Verdinal, who fought in the war. Eliot stated he had wished to be part of the campaign, but didn't enlist because of his nationality. Verdinal died in 1915 on the battlefield. It is believed most of this section was Eliot's response to his friend's death and the Great War in general. Another speaker in this section speaks of hyacinths and being called the hyacinth girl. Though we really don't know who the speaker is in this part, we believe, perhaps, it is Eliot himself speaking of the effect that Verdinal's death had on him. 
Elliot had mentioned once in a commentary that one of the last memories he had of Verdinal was seeing him waving a bunch of hyacinths. Verdinal's cause of death was drowning, and it is suggested that lines 35 through 43 speak directly of Verdinal and his untimely death. In line 43, we see another speaker telling of an encounter with a fortune teller who we know as Madame Solstress. The speaker seems to question her credibility by stating that she had a bad cold, which humanizes her. He then says she was known to be the wisest woman in Europe. It is interesting to note the satire seen in these few lines. The speaker seems to imply that Madame Sustris, in her great wisdom, could not see or recognize the impending threat to the European society. She is said to have a wicked pack of tarot cards that identifies the speaker as the drowned Phoenician sailor, which is one of her cards. It is suggested that perhaps this is a reference to Eliot's friend, Verdinal. In line 56, the fortune teller predicts crowds of people walking around in a ring. This is suggestive of soldiers returning from war, many who were shell-shocked. In the last part of this section, the speaker refers to crowds flowing over London Bridge. This could be a reference to Madame Sostre's foretelling of swarms of people flowing over the bridge heading to work in what the speaker calls an unreal city. This also could be the soldiers that are returning from war which had been so adversely affected by the many different ways. The speaker recognizes a member of the crowd and calls him Stetson. The speaker identifies Stetson as someone he fought in the war with. He asks Stetson if the corpse he had planted in his garden last year had sprouted or bloomed. This passage possibly refers back to the beginning where the speaker was a corpse. This may also speak of a loved one of the speaker who was killed in the war. In the final lines of this passage, the speaker expresses a disgust of the waste and the crumbling away of the world that he has known. Many believe this speaker may also be Eliot himself. In A Game of Chess, a different speaker is now exploring the social world of the wasteland. The use of a chess game in the title suggests it is about the difference between an orderly and a disorderly environment, or perhaps two queens that are squared off against each other on a chessboard. As the section begins, we see a husband or a lover watching a woman in a dressing room brushing her hair. This is perhaps intended as a contrast to the hyacinth girl in the first section with her wet hair. As this woman brushes her hair, it is described as spreading out into fiery points, indicating dry, static-filled hair. The elegant and lush setting described is that of an upper-class woman in a dressing room or boudoir. The speaker mentions a painting that is hung in the dressing room that appears as a scene of a woman being raped. The speaker changes the setting and tells the story of Philomel being raped by her brother-in-law. During the act, she attempted to cry out, but her words were unheard. The speaker describes the words as jug jug, indicating they were unintelligible. After the act, Philomel was changed into a nightingale, where she could once again speak, but her language was still unintelligible to humans. She went on with her life, but she was never the same woman again. We see again Eliot speaking of the soldiers' lives that had been changed forever by the experiences of the war. This is repeated a few lines later. As the setting changes back to the dressing room, the woman begs the man who is watching her to stay with her. The man doesn't answer and seems to have no emotion. The woman becomes frustrated with him because of his lack of response or emotion. She begs the man to respond and say what is on his mind, but he says nothing. This is perhaps a mental picture of the lives of the many shell-shocked soldiers who are returning to home after the war, but were not the same as before. When the man finally speaks, he shows definite signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. He tells her he thinks they are in the trenches, rats alleys as he calls them. He is then spooked by the sound of the wind under the door and becomes rather agitated. Then, as quickly as he becomes agitated, he changes his emotions and begins to sing lines from a song, something about the Shakespearean rag. 
Again, this seems to be pointing out the horror that the soldiers experienced, even after returning home. In the second part of this section, beginning at line 138, a new speaker takes over. This speaker, who is speaking to someone named Lil, seems to be on the opposite social scale, someone from the British working class. This is indicated by the dialect used here. The term demobbed is a slang term for demobilized that was heard in the lower class sections of Britain at the time. This scene also takes place in a pub, as indicated by the barman who is impatiently calling out to the customers, hurry up please, it's time. This is equivalent to our last call that is heard today. Being one of the more interesting scenes of the poem, it has narrative qualities as well as lyrical qualities in the same section. As we continue to read, the dialogue seems to be rushed and incomplete. Most analysts agree that Eliot wrote it this way intentionally, to give it the illusion of being inside a noisy pub. Also, we get the sense, by the repetitive call of the barman, hurry up, it's time, that there is the possibility that the bar will close at any moment, interrupting the dialogue, leaving us hanging. It is also believed that Eliot's wife, Vivian, actually wrote the majority of this scene in order to give it a woman's voice. Interestingly, many believe that Vivian orchestrated the use of this narrative voice in order to draw the reader in, just as a listener would have been drawn into such a conversation in a real pub. Here, the speaker is carrying on a conversation with Lil and seems to be giving her advice about her marriage. Lil's husband, Albert, is coming home from the war. The speaker recalls in a conversation in line 142, well, Albert gave Lil some money for a set of false teeth. The speaker recalls being present when Albert said this to his wife, and even recalls Albert making an offhanded remark about her looks. The speaker herself comments that Lil is looking older, even at the age of 31. Lil explains in line 159, that this is a side effect from the medication she took to end an unwanted pregnancy. We then understand that the money Albert sent to Lil to improve her looks was spent on an abortion instead. We see that this changed Lil's appearances and her life forever. We see again a reference to how soldiers' lives had been altered by the ravages of the war, but we also see a reference to how the war affected the families back home. The next section, the fire sermon, is possibly the most elusive part of the poem, but Eliot still gives some insight into its meaning. The title of this section gets its name from a sermon said to have been given by Buddha to a group of devoted followers. In this sermon, Buddha warns followers to reject the material world in favor of the, in favor of the spiritual one. His warning suggests that only a release of preoccupation of the materialistic broken images spoken of in the first section would bring about true enlightenment. The Greek mythology character Tiresias is finally named in this section and is said to be the main narrator of the entire poem. The speaker opens this section on the bank of the Thames River in early winter where the last of the leaves are falling into the water. Here he sits observing the true desolation and waste of London. Interpretation becomes more difficult at this point as the narrative through line gets a little out of focus. However, one thing that can be noted about this section, it tends to refer often to the unfruitful and meaningless relationships that are seen earlier in the first two sections. In the first 12 lines or so of this section, the speaker is describing a scene of desolation, void of any signs of life. Eliot interweaves biblical verses throughout this section, this being one. The speaker sits on the river bank and weeps over the scene of the desolation that he sees. This line comes from Psalms 137, which reads, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept, then we remembered Zion. We then see in line 187, the speaker is describing a rat crawling through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly along the bank. Eliot is again, possibly, trying tying this scene with the life that soldiers faced in the trenches during the war and with rats crawling along the damp ground. In line 203, the speaker refers back to the scene in section 2, a game of chess, of a painting in the woman's dressing room and it is envisioned the sylvan scene where the sexual lust was forced upon the woman. Again, 
Here her only response was jug jug. This is also possibly referring to the inability to verbally express the horrors of the fighting and living in the trenches of war. It may also be another reference to the incoherent speech that was common among those suffering from shell shock. In the next major scene, Tiresias describes observing a date between a young typist and a city agent's clerk at the typist's apartment. Tiresias describes the scene as taking place at the violet hour, which is the evening hour of dusk. The description of the time of day is sometimes associated with the time of sexual yearning. At the apartment, Tiresias spies on the young typist and the carbuncular city clerk, as he is described, as they engage in cold-blooded sexual liaison. The passage describes the clerk's action on the date as undesired yet unreproved. His exploring hands meet no defense, yet the typist is obviously uninterested and numb to what is happening to her. Many critics explain what is being described as date rape. Critics say Eliot is using the story to express feelings of what happened to Great Britain and London during the war, which is sometimes referred to as the Rape of London. After the deed is done, the young typist responds simply by saying, I'm glad it's over, indicating that this act was brutal and meaningless to her. It also indicates to the reader that this is a fruitless relationship and the typist and clerk are unlikely to meet again. In the final lines of this section, we see more descriptions of the desolate state of London, and we see more waste scattered about. Here, Tiresias is described observing another meaningless sexual encounter in which the violated states, I can connect nothing with nothing, once the act is finished. The final three lines describe the consequences of the voyeuristic way Tiresias moves in and out of the lives of the characters in this section. It also reiterates the central image of Buddha's fire sermon. The next section is a rather brief one. It is certainly more elusive than other parts of the poem that are mentioned at the beginning. Most believe that it is referring to the drowned Phoenician sailor of the first section in the encounter with Madame Sostris. Some critics suggest this section also refers to the death of, the, of Great Britain with no chance of resurrection or perhaps the sacrificial death that is symbolized in baptism, where one dies to sin and is buried underwater, yet rises again to become a new being. The final section is a summary of the entire poem. It is also the most elusive of the poem. Again, we believe Tiresias is still speaking here, but we see many more voices interwoven throughout this section. Lines 322 to 330 are said to be referring to Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, his trial, and eventually his crucifixion. From 331 to 359, we see the dry rocky ground again from this first section. Line 357 mentions the song of the hermit thrush heard in the pine trees. Eliot mentions this bird here because its song sounds like dripping water, giving the illusion that there is water in the wasteland. Here the speaker is given some hope but only finds it to be the song of a bird. Line 378 begins a passage of a woman brushing out her long black hair, tight like the strings of a violin. This is possibly referring again to the first woman we see in section 2 in her dressing room. The speaker then describes seeing bats with babies' faces in the violet light. This is thought to be referring to Lil in the pub of a game of chess. We recall Lil had an aborted an unwanted pregnancy. It is believed the bats with babies' faces is a representation of the abortion. It is also suggested that this passage could represent the speaker's horror at the thought of a sexual encounter producing offspring to be flung into the wasteland. A little further, we hear the thunder speaking, saying to the humans, control yourselves, give and have compassion. This is a reference back to the Buddhist fire sermon of section 3, warning against selfishness, materialism, and lust. Lines 415 to 423 possibly refer to the brutal sexual attack on the typist by the clerk later in that section. The speaker explains the virtues of self-control, suggesting perhaps this situation could have turned out differently had the virtues taught in the fire sermon been embodied by. 
The speaker then refers back to the fishermen who sat on the banks of the Thames River. At line 426, the speaker asks, Shall I at least set my lands in order? This line is another reference to biblical scripture. In Isaiah 38, 1, we read how King Hezekiah was about to die and was told to get his affairs in order. Hezekiah prayed for more time and was granted 15 more years of life in which to bring his country back to its original state. Perhaps Eliot is stating that he feels that there could be hope for the state of Great Britain as well. Eliot ends the poem with the repetition of Dada, Dadiadavam, Damyada, then repetition of Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Roughly translated, this means practice self-control, give and have mercy. By this you will have peace that passes understanding. Perhaps Eliot is sending us a message here. Although we will probably never fully understand what life is and why things happen as they do, we can reach a place of acceptance. Only then can we have a peace about life and ourselves. Perhaps as Eliot came to the end of riding the wasteland, he had finally reached that place. Mm -hmm.